thanks to my old friend Alicia and to everyone associated with the club. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's often my practice when you get a truly special invitation like this one and get such a call to say, oh, that's great, who canceled? <laughs> In this case, it was Steve Forbes. <laughs> I recognize I'm a, I'm a uh, poor uh, substitute. Uh, you know, Steve Forbes, uh, he's written six books. I've written one. He publishes Forbes magazine. I guess I could say I publish Outdoor Indiana. <laughs> he's run for President of the United States. I'll leave that one right there. I'm familiar with, I've, I've been a fill-in before. I know how to, how to do this. I, my, my favorite uh, uh, story about this, I saw it in the Sporting News one time, and it, it involved indirectly our old uh, uh, Hoosier uh, hero, uh, Coach Knight, who uh, for a while thought about, and was very visibly thinking about, taking the job in New Mexico. Maybe you remember this a long time ago. Ultimately, he withdrew from the running. They uh, fall back to a guy named Dave Bliss. At Coach Bliss's inaugural press conference, his, he and his wife met the New Mexico media for the first time, and somebody asked the, the natural, if impolite, question uh, to Mrs. Bliss, how do you feel when the whole country knows that uh, your, your husband was not New Mexico's first choice? She said, doesn't bother me. He wasn't my first choice either. <laughs> to meet her but one day before I go. Uh, <clears throat> I brought a little slideshow along. I, I got up one day last week and decided maybe uh, both because this is a data-driven um, um, and a well-informed audience and also maybe as a little variety on just the long oration, I would, I would try to show you a few things along the way and I hope uh, that it will enliven and not deaden the uh, next half hour before we get to your questions. And um, I promised Alicia this will not make her feel like she's back at work. Uh, I hope you've improved on this, but there were a whole lot of the PowerPoint stuff when we were at Lilly together, as I recall. Alicia and I used to say that if a, uh, if a, um, a Lilly scientist, w when a Lilly scientist passed away and presented the credentials to St. Peter and was challenged for entrance, it, the first words would be, first slide, please. So here you go, and uh, uh, there's some statistics in here, but I hope you'll find them of some use. Uh, my father uh, spent his last years in an assisted living home here in town, and uh, I was over there shooting the breeze with him one day, and in small talk I said, hey, Dad, I, I read in the newspaper where in places like this, the ratio of women to men is 6.2 to 1. Dad said, that is the most useless statistic I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> So if any of these are useless, I apologize in advance. I'm going to move quickly uh, because, uh, uh, as I say, I know the questions will probably be the, uh, the most uh, illuminating part of all this. Um, we have um, adopted as the objective of our administration, above and beyond, transcending all others, building the very best business climate we can in Indiana, raising the net income of Hoosiers. Uh, I want to talk a little bit. I, I just thought today would be, a, at least for me, a useful time to um, roll the tape back, think about five years of effort on this, what we've done, what is undone, build a better climate to align our administration with this objective of a brighter uh, economic uh, uh, future for Hoosiers, and, um, and then talk a little bit about some things that are in front of us right now. Um, my, my colloquial term for this always has been build the best sandbox in America, that one way or another we want to do all that we can do. And we hit the door in 2005 with a lot of commitments and a lot of ambitions, and we got a lot of those things done. Uh, we cashiered the old bu state bureaucracy, which I, I thought had an unacceptably poor record and, and was too slow and too stodgy, and really no, nobody in there had seemed to have any sense of business. 
We created something called the Economic Development Corporation. It is a nonprofit corporation. Many of you are its supporters. We thank you. It has proven, I think, a superior mousetrap, moving quickly and uh, speaking business to business with people who might invest and take risks in our state. The 21 fund is, uh, is now is, is a fund that uh, supports R&D efforts in the state, and uh, we totally reconfigured it. It used to give uh, money, uh, with apologies to my former employer, other large companies and our large universities, love them all. But these dollars are finite, and we wanted to, them to go to the new, the promising entrepreneurial companies that might blossom, and many of them have. We increased the R&D tax credit in Indiana, the, one of the highest in America. We instituted a uh, Buy Indiana policy that I'll come back to later. I forget what DSD stands for. Or I, <laughs> at least I've tried to. Um, and a host of other things um, aimed at, uh, at generating uh, more uh, capital for business and a better chance to get your money back. A, a rather minor item, but one I want to draw to your attention because it was so emblematic, it was the uh, sales tax exemption we instituted on R&D equipment. Now, uh, uh, before 2005, for, uh, for a long time, Indiana had exempted from sales tax, manufacturing equipment, drills and lathes and drill presses and lathes and the like. Why? Because they were understood to be tools of work. We did not exempt from sales tax centrifuges or spectrometers or computer equipment or lab equipment. Uh, it, to me, it summed up the mentality that looked backward to the economy we knew and failed to understand the huge changes we were going to have to go through as a state. So. Uh, now that is a level playing field, and we are as open to the new economy as the old. 2006 was another big year. Major moves was uh, our shorthand for the uh, toll road transaction. It liberated trapped value, $4 billion of it, uh, from, um, in essence, an underperforming asset. And we are reinvesting that money, in, as I will show you, in the infrastructure, which is, uh, we think, so important to the future uh, economic prospects of a state that calls itself the crossroads of America. We reform telecommunications in a way no other state in the country has yet matched. Uh, you can go into that business now in Indiana with one piece of paper, essentially. You don't have to negotiate with 92 counties or uh, hundreds of, of local communities. And uh, in what you may think of as a technical matter, but I hope to demonstrate otherwise, we moved from a three-factor to a single-factor sales tax. Here's a little quick little uh, Q&A for you. If, you, if your goal is to maximize economic growth, which of these would you tax? The percentage of a company's sales in Indiana, the percentage of its workers worldwide that reside here, or the percentage of the capital investment that it makes in Indiana um, as opposed to anywhere else, or all of the above? We were taxing all of the above. In other words, uh, Indiana said to its corporations, um, the more people, the more Hoosiers you hire and the more capital you invest in our state, the higher your taxes will be. How's that sound? Um, now we simply say something different. We say we want you to hire everybody you can rationalize hiring. We want you to invest as much as you can here, and that's all tax-free. And then we want you to sell your good or service all over the world. And the more you do that, the better off you'll be in Indiana. 2007, we a little, a little step, but one that, again, I hope says something, sends a signal to you and to the rest of the economy. In Indiana, uh, and only one other state that I know of, if you patent a good or service now, um, we will exempt from taxation up, uh, up to a, a certain size of business and up to, for the first few years, the uh, income you earn uh, if you manufacture that product or produce that service here in our state. We are saying to the innovators of the world, there's no place more friendly, no place more excited about you and the new value you might add to the economy than Indiana is. We passed the uh, uh, health care plan that, that um, Alicia made mention to. It's bringing the peace of mind of health care now to 50,000 Hoosier families. Sadly, it's going to be... Um, eliminated by the bill passed the other day, but while it's here, it is not only doing right by low-income people, but I hope it has taken some pressure off smaller businesses 
knowing that some of their employees, uh, if they can't afford it, will still have health insurance. 2008 was the year of property tax relief. And as I will show you a little later on, this was, yes, initially and primarily about promoting home ownership, protecting those in their homes in this state, but it is also, as we always suspected, being found to be a tremendous enhancement of the business climate of this state too. Could only be this way, of course, when you lower property taxes by more than a third, cap them and provide certainty going forward. Uh, it can only mean good things for businesses directly and good things for them indirectly as their customers and their neighbors have a little more disposable income. 2008 was the first year in Indiana state history we achieved a AAA credit rating. As you know, uh, that is a, at the intersection of a state's economic stability as assessed by the rating agencies, its fiscal policy. And uh, we're glad that then and still today, Indiana is seen as one of the few states deserving of that highest rating. We're determined to keep it. And we will continue to do things to enhance our sandbox uh, each and every year, and we welcome your suggestions as to what those might be. Pursuant to building that kind of climate, we tried to staff our administration and point our administration uh, entirely at this goal of enhancing the Indiana econo the economic prospects for, in for Hoosiers, particularly those Hoosiers uh, who started with the fewest advantages. I gathered in a room in a hotel not far from here, our first appointees, uh, before we took the oath of office, so in the transition from election to inauguration. And I said to them on that day that every great enterprise, profit or nonprofit, I ever saw uh, had uh, a very clear objective. Sometimes it had been reduced to a phrase and everybody wore it around on a little laminated card, but one way or another, everybody in the organization or the business knew what it was. And in the very best operations, everybody knew what their part in it, in delivering that objective was, and was being measured and rewarded based on how well they and their teammates performed their part. And I said, uh, so um, the objective of our administration is to raise the net disposable income of Hoosiers. We're going to do everything we can do to bring more jobs here. We're going to bring jobs, if we can, that pay more than the current average. So over the long haul, we try to bring up the average income of our fellow citizens. And we're going to do all we can to make government efficient so that we can leave more of those dollars in their pockets. And um, we try not to stray very far from that objective. We put in a Buy Indiana program. It's responsible. We don't make any bad deals. But all else equal or almost equal. It's your state government buys from Hoosiers. Now, we don't know what the number was. It had been estimated at only about 60% of state procurement uh, purchased in the state um, back in, uh, in our arrival. We measure this every month. We're at 87%. We set 90 as a goal. Is it arbitrary? I don't know what the maximum will be, but we're getting close right now. I bring this up today because I don't want to miss this opportunity. You should think this way, too. I see far too many Indiana businesses, for no good reason I can identify, going out of state. I, may, I think it's the distant expert phenomenon. You can't imagine that that software company down the block could be any good. I mean, they live here. And so I talk to a lot of Hoosier businesses. There are some in this room who can successfully win business on the East Coast, the West Coast, internationally, and can't sell a big company down the street. So I just, ask you, I just ask you to think about your own self-interest. This is not an act of charity. You'll be better off, we'll be able to keep your taxes lower longer if the businesses around you do a little better. And you can um, go to, uh, what do we call it, Supplier Gateway at the IEDC and find a list of thousands of Indiana businesses you may not know about who might help you improve your margins. These are our investments in highway infrastructure only. I could show you clean water and university construction and bars on top of these. I just want you to understand that while across America uh, there is a crisis, you've read about it ad nauseum, uh, a crumbling infrastructure and totally inadequate public finances for, to uh, even maintain, let alone improve it, Indiana's in the midst of a, of a boom. 
hundreds of projects uh, that are very important to a state that um, uh, is a, a transportation distribution logistics hub. Uh, we're going on at record rates and um, that will continue for the next several years. Now, when we talk about aligning an, our administration and everybody having a role in it, um, it means things like this. Um, time is money. So we have said to people, if, if, the, if business has to interact with you, we don't want, we have not made one regulation, one iota more lenient or relaxed. Some have been toughened. What we have said to those people who have regulatory jobs in our administration is, we want you to be predictable and consistent, and we want you to be as quick as you rationally can be. And um, so we measure things like the turnaround time for environmental permits, which you see here. Here's the turnaround time for tax refunds. Incidentally, if Indiana owes you tax refund, we actually send you cash, not an IOU, like Kansas or California. Or <laughs> some of these. Isn't, that, isn't that quaint? Here's waiting times at the BMV uh, in, uh, eight minutes and six seconds on average in uh, December, if you're curious, uh, or in, uh, uh, yeah, last quarter, if you're curious. I know it doesn't have anything to do with business. I just couldn't resist putting it up there. <laughs> I just want to show you this picture to tell a quick story. This is the sing this is Medco. Uh, soon to open the world's most advanced, largest, most technologically amazing mail order pharmacy uh, at Anson out here between, between uh, Indianapolis and Lafayette. And it was a very spirited competition. Um, Medco on a payroll basis is bigger than Honda. Not as many people, but the jobs average almost 70, or over $70,000 per. We're so proud to have them. This is a huge win for our state. And uh, after it was over, as I often do, always do, I asked uh, if, if you're willing to tell me what were the tiebreakers? Why us not happen to be Kentucky? And um, uh, there were a couple of uh, answers, but the one that caught my ear was they said, oh, and your board of pharmacy. I said, our board of pharmacy? They said, oh yeah. They said, we need scores of separate licenses to operate in every state. I don't know how this works exactly, but they needed a whole complex of licenses from wherever it was going to be. And the answer in the other state was, uh, yes, um, our board meets quarterly. Now the next agenda is full, but we can get you on in the, the quarter after that. And probably within a few months, if there aren't any problems, we can handle this. Our board of pharmacy helped schedule an emergency meeting nine days later and gave them the licenses in a week. So I love to take this story around our administration now and say, you may not think that whatever you're doing uh, can bring an, the next job to Indiana, but if the Board of Pharmacy can, <laughs> you're going to have your chance. Okay, we come to the, my favorite part of any such program, the maps. This is AAA bond ratings. Uh, did you notice the other day, speaking of Warren, someone was speaking of Warren Buffett up here. Uh, in the last few weeks, Berkshire Hathaway, uh, P&G, Lowe's, or some forth, J and Johnson & Johnson, uh, their debt is all traded at less than two-year treasury notes. And um, you read, you know, Moody says Uncle Sam may lose his AAA. Amazing thing to think your state might have better credit than your federal government. But if they may lose theirs, we're going to try to hold on to ours. So here's a low cost of doing business. I hope the product of everything we just talked about. Here's low taxes all by themselves. Here's workers' compensation rates. We're in the most affordable five or six states. This is overall business climate by the site selectors of the country. This is CEO, the last CEO survey. Indiana, again, an island along with some of the Sun Belt. This is CNBC um, business friendliness overall. This is the objective we are constantly seeking. Now, we all know and have known for a long time that Indiana stood on too narrow a base. We've been a manufacturing powerhouse, may it ever be, but uh, it is um, absolutely essential that uh, we broaden our economic base and we've been working on this. Um, 
these are the 800 plus transactions in which the IEDC has been involved. It's obviously just a fraction of the economic activity in the state, but you'll notice that, uh, let's see if this thing will ever work, it does. So this is manufacturing, this is auto, still a big piece of this, and this is other. TDL is uh, transportation and, and distribution and logistics. Note the growth of IT, our fastest growing sector in the last couple of years in life sciences. Think about the changes we've seen. I get to see them in this job all the time. This is the Thompson television plant, one of the last plants, I guess the last plant in America that was still making old vacuum tube TVs up until not too long ago, very sadly. Nobody buys those anymore and it went out of business. In that facility now, Cook Pharmaca, a biotech manufacturing company uh, uh, on the front edge of, of the life sciences. Um, down in the southern part of the state, there are women like the one whose hands are pictured here who were seamstresses in a business that's not much done in America anymore. It turns out they were very well uh, trained to put catheters together at Med Ventures, an exciting company we brought across the river from Louisville. Uh, they, make me they make equipment and they make parts for the medical device industry. Our life sciences industry, is, this room is full of people who have participated through bio crossroads or in other fashions and making this a reality in our state. It's growing very fast. It's, it's achieving that virtuous cycle that, uh, in which one company can lead to the next and to the next. And, and um, basically uh, on the corridor between Lafayette and Bloomington, but as you see here, um, uh, spread out much more widely than some may have realized. We have a defense industry of sorts now. I must admit, I was a little skeptical of this one to start with, but have been uh, persuaded and won over by the evidence and by our success. We were at the very er uh, brink about four years ago of seeing the very last installation disappear from Indiana. Fort Ben was in jeopardy of, of going away and, and uh, only a great goal line stand um, saved the Crane uh, Surface Warfare Center. Now we have four. The, Fort Bend Finance Center is bigger than it was. Atterbury is the mobilization and demobilization point, the biggest one in the, the country. Crane is thriving. There's a there are tech park springing up along its borders. If you don't know what Crane is, go check it out. It's an incredible hidden um, asset for us. And we are building the biggest uh, uh, urban warfare training center in America on what was to be bulldozed at the old Muscatatuck State Hospital. Um, 50,000 people in, in 500 different units of all kinds will train there this year, and the number's shooting straight up. Each one of those people comes equipped with per diem check. <laughs> A lot of the folks who are shipping out for Afghanistan to work in reconstructions, not just for military purposes anymore. Yes, special forces are there, snipers are there, people, they can practice. Uh, urban uh, warfare tactics, but also uh, a lot of Hoosiers are now role-playing, it's a fascinating thing to see, role-playing uh, Afghani uh, citizens or Iraqi citizens, and uh, this is, we believe, a real cash generator for us going forward. This is defense contracting, um, growing off a low base for a state our size, but growing very fast. So here's one you may not have paid a lot of attention to, but we think it has promise. We want we started out saying we want to be, we do not want to slip into the position of being an energy importer. All the forecasts had us doing that. We're a little more ambitious than that now. Energy is not only a, a critical input and enabler, affordable energy is part of that low cost structure that we show people. But it can be an important inter, uh, uh, industry in its own right. I think you may know that uh, we've been the leading state in terms of the growth rate of wind power in the last. Uh, Two years. Here's uh, some out uh, northwest. An unidentified motorcyclist is uh, <laughs> is admiring the growth of uh, of the Benton County wind farm in that case. But it's not just wind power. We are we are now a national leader in biofuels, important to our ag economy, but also to uh, um, it, it's bringing investment and jobs and income to some of our rural communities that hadn't seen any in a long time. The world's first true clean coal plant under construction at Edwards Port right now. Soon we hope to be followed by the world's first true uh, coal to natural gas plant uh, not too far from there. 
Automobile manufacturing is very interesting. Um, we, of course, you know our heritage here, but the face of our that industry has changed substantially. Far fewer workers, but producing more units. This is the same story in steel, by the way. Um, and um, we are gaining, we, what you need to know is we are gaining market share in autos. Um, seventh to fifth in vehicle production. Our overall share is predicted to go as high as third. Maybe it can go higher. Um, and so diversification does not mean walking away from traditional strengths. It means building on them. Uh, of course, the, the nature of that industry has changed a lot in the States. We have more than twice as many people now employed by the international, internationally based companies as we do by the legacy companies, GM and Chrysler. And um, a huge multiple of the number of vehicles actually assembled here are at Honda and Toyota and Subaru. Um, getting hard, you know, to know what to call these things anymore. Last year, the um, annual survey done by cars.com, they measured the content of cars. The most American car company was Toyota. It's not, and, and the cars themselves are changing. We think we have a great chance in Indiana to lead the electric car transformation that I believe is coming. Again, I started as a little doubtful on this. I'm now convinced that this is not only a great thing for America, but can be very practical. We have four companies already, more than anybody else, uh, producing or are planning to produce vehicles in the state, not to mention the um, uh, new uh, opportunity this has created for companies like uh, Delphi with their long tradition in automotive electronics. The batteries for uh, the first street production cars, in, um, which we think will be the Think vehicle, are going to come out of Enerdale here in the northeast uh, side of this town. And I also want to, I, I can't leave this point without mentioning that uh, existing businesses, all the efforts we make to help them grow, all the efforts we make to woo them to our state, will never be a complete answer to the Indiana economic um, strategy. Uh, harder to get one's hands on, but essential to concentrate on they are those dynamic, uh, unpredictable businesses that spring from the genius of free people when, when they're enabled and encouraged to uh, start new enterprises and, and, um, and uh, try new uh, ideas. And a uh, story, I think, in the last day or two in the paper here about yet another venture fund in this state that would add to a growing trend of more available capital for the dreamers and the, and, uh, the innovators that uh, we seek to woo and welcome. Let me uh, talk for just a few minutes about some things that are just ahead of us here. You'll get a chance this fall to uh, vote on making property tax reduction and limitation permanent in our state. This, would, this vote would, would amend our Constitution. It would not be necessary, uh, but for the very real possibility that, uh, that the uh, language of our 1848 Constitution might not permit the bill as it was written. So we have to modernize the Constitution to fit the bill. I hope you'll vote yes. I think you'd be wise to do so. And not merely because uh, your uh, home will be more affordable, more valuable, your children's uh, first homes will be more purchasable, your parents' homes will be more, uh, uh, eat more easily uh, financed, uh, but also because this, as we always suspected, is going to be good for business in this state. Fall State that uh, recently, within the last couple weeks, completed their analysis on it and forecast, as you see here, a substantial uh, boost to both employment and income in Indiana over time. Unemployment insurance, much in the news. I think you know that um, an effort was made last year to um, make the system a little more um, self-sustaining and then has been postponed for one year while we await events around the country and, and also federally. Here's what you need to understand about unemployment insurance. This is a very, we have been living with a very lopsided system. Some of the lowest premiums in America, 40th by the latest measure. Some of the highest benefits in America, third by the latest measure. 
This system was leaking money when we were at full employment two years ago. And I asked people who were around when this arrangement was set up, you know, what did you expect to happen? Very low premiums and very high benefits. They said, well, we expected we'd have to fix it one day. I said, well, thanks a heck of a lot. That, you know, that some days now. <laughs> and so uh, we will have to, to deal with this. But, uh, um, you know, um, I recently came across a quote by the famous old uh, sea lord of Britain a hundred and some years ago, Jackie Fisher, uh, who uh, in a different context said, now that the money has run out, we will have to begin to think. <laughs> so that's the story about unemployment insurance. As we think, you just do bear this in mind, not to minimize the importance of this at all, but this is a relatively small fraction of the total business taxes paid, 6%. And so if and when it is necessary to adjust both the as we should, both the premium and the benefits, um, uh, let's not overestimate uh, how much it changes. And by the way, the change of last year when factored into those business tax rankings I talked about didn't move us at all, didn't budge us. So I'm glad we postponed it. Uh, we need to find a more balanced approach to this. We need to see what the national picture is like. Uh, Two-thirds of the states are, alre are already in arrears as we are, so it's almost a universal problem. But um, uh, we'll approach it with common sense when the time comes. Here's the biggest one. Um, these are revenue collections. If you can't read it, this is 04 uh, on the uh, left. And, and this is uh, the year we're in, fiscal year 10, ending June 30th. This is next year, the second year of the budget cycle. Uh, this fiscal year 10 is the lowest receipts. Forget inflation, just in nominal terms, lowest receipts in six years since fiscal 04. And uh, uh, next year, and this is probably the most important data point, even if we get a rather smart bounce back in revenue, as the, the forecast, which is uh, not held up for 17 straight months, but assume it does, and we get a big bounce back in revenue, we will still have fewer dollars to work with than we did in, um, in 2006 basically back to the levels of six years before. Some of you may be running a business with a s lower top line six years later, but if you are, I'm, I'm sympathetic. I, mean, I know what you're dealing with, and now you know what we are. Um, so if you think the budget process this year was difficult, um, just wait. These are reserves. You'll remember that we had at the close of the last budget just nine months ago now, a billion three, there was a big debate about it. And eventually there was a compromise that we would spend uh, 300 million, keep a billion. That did not happen and will not. As it turned out, revenue is running so far below, even the lowered forecast from last June, that it's gonna take uh, all our reserves basically to get through this budget cycle. We will use the savings accounts, the rainy day funds. That's all right, that's what, why we, worked hard to create them in the first place. By the way, the red line is the do-nothing line. The budget passed just months ago. If we had spent to the level of that budget, this is the zero line down here, we would have run out of reserves late this summer. So of course you don't do nothing in that situation. We have done a number of things. No one's happy about them. We get a lot of criticism for them, but it took all those steps including reductions in higher ed and education to get us to the end of the budget cycle using all our reserves. That's how difficult this, uh, this process is. This is what we haven't done and don't intend to. These are states raising taxes. And all around, the, the worst, some of the worst examples are all around us. Why are we so resolute about this? First of all, because people who are struggling in a bad economy right now do not need more of their scarce dollars taken from them but I'm gonna end where we began. We are, every time, we, uh, every month that goes by, and we find another way to keep things glued together in Indiana without raising taxes on individuals, on consumption, on businesses directly, while other states take the easy way out and raise them, and as Illinois just about to double their income taxes, some such, 
uh, Indiana gets a little bit more competitive. Our sandbox looks a little bit better compared to the one next door or the one on the coast. And that's why we're so committed to this because it is our goal, it is our ambition that Indiana and the young Hoosiers coming up have every economic opportunity possible, that there is no better place for the existing or the new business anywhere in America because we know there are no more deserving people, um, no more deserving workers of the future than the young people we are raising right here. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. few questions that have already come up, one of which may not be a surprise to anyone in this audience, and that is, um, have you made any decisions yet about who you'll select as your running mate? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as far as I know, the filing uh, date for the Columbia Club officers is not for another <laughs> few months, so <laughs> the answer is no. Um, <laughs> I can wait longer than you can, Alicia. <laughs> All right. So, do you know whether or not Attorney General uh, Greg Zeller has or will pursue legal action against the federal government regarding health insurance reform? I believe he will. I've encouraged him to. Uh, I'm under no illusions that there's a. I'm, uh, I'm skeptical that, uh, that, that there'll be a, a, a judicial rescue, although there's, a very, there's some very good uh, uh, arguments, I think, to be made. This is the first time, I, I think it's historically inarguable, this is the first time that the federal government has attempted to order individual Americans to uh, purchase something or spend their money on something. But um, I, I have no way of knowing whether the courts would give how much deference they would give to the Congress on this, but uh, I think it's a important. There are some important principles to be spoken for, and I, I do believe Indiana should join what looks like to be a large number of states who will, and also private actions that uh, will will raise those questions. Thank you. So, somewhat uh, along the same lines as health care reform, but turning a little bit now that Obamacare has passed. Do you think the national VAT tax is inevitable, and what do you think will be the ultimate impact of that? I don't know that it's inevitable. I, I think it's inevitable that there'll be attempts to impose one. I don't think I need to spend any time in this audience uh, uh, persuading you that this nation has piled up an absolutely mathematically unsustainable unaffordable set of commitments already, and that's before Sunday night. It, um, whatever the, the spectrum or continuum of views in this room about uh, how large or small, uh, expansive or limited government should be, set all that aside for a moment. If, if you can do sixth grade arithmetic, you can tell that we cannot possibly pay the bills we've already piled up. We cannot possibly meet the commitments that we have made um, to ourselves in Social Security and Medicare and so forth. And the, the bill of Sunday, um, again, people can think it's good or bad health care policy, but I, I'm here to tell you it is fraudulent to assert that it will not add to the debt of on this country. It is You know, with every gimmick known to man, and I, I, I spent, you know, a, a sentence in federal employment uh, not that long ago, I, I know a little about how these things are done. W with every gimmick known to man and some new ones, they managed to pass the Washington straight face test, but that's an easy test, that somehow over 10 years this thing would break even. Well, I think you've read enough to know all the reasons that is absolute bunk. So let's just... Not kid any, no one should kid anyone, even if you love the policy, this has made the debt problem worse. It's going to make it much worse. 
And so, yes, I think before long, people will be arguing for a VAT tax. It, the idea of replacing taxation on income with a consumption tax, I think, is worth looking at. And that's been batted around for a long time. It makes some sense, honestly. Uh, if you could tax investment and risk taking and hard work a little less and tax consumption, which is largely or in a much large part um, voluntary, uh, more in an even exchange, you might have done something good in terms of building the national sandbox. That's not what's going to be suggested, of course. This is going to be suggested on top of the taxes of today due to the desperation of the debt situation. And all I can say is we better be careful. One thing that people who like taxes like about the VAT tax is this is, this is the boiling the frog thing. You can just dial that little dude up, you know, a little bit at a time and it, most people won't notice. So it's a real engine for generating a lot of money, or transferring a lot of money from the private to the public sector. But yes, I think you'll hear more about it. And in the context of a, of a major fix to, our, to this immorally, I choose that word carefully, immorally, huge burden we're about to place on our children, I wouldn't rule anything out. There are a number of members of the audience who are um, curious about your thoughts regarding education. Uh, comments and questions that range everywhere from lower property taxes, meaning less money for schools, balancing the budget on the backs of, of schools. And in mm -hmm. general, I think the question is, uh, it's very important to have a well-educated workforce to have a strong economy. And so what, in your view, are the keys to improving education in our state? Yeah, well, it isn't money. If it were money, we'd have fixed this problem by now. So I, thinking this might come up, <laughs> I have come prepared. First of all, let me say, uh, I am all for more investments in education. We have raised it every single year until this year. We have raised it 12% during the years I've been serving as governor. And uh, all else equal, I'm, I'm for that. Second. Um, the 3%, really 2.7% reduction in operating spending, just the operating spending, that we were forced after doing everything else first uh, to impose is tiny compared to what's gone on in most states of this country. You know, one downside, I suppose, of keeping things glued together as Hoosiers have is you don't, unless you pay a lot of attention, you don't realize how bad it is elsewhere. Media asked me a, long, a little while ago, I said, what keeps you up at night? I said, I sleep pretty well. I said, but if I don't, I don't have to count sheep. I just count all the states I'm glad I'm not the governor of. <laughs> so we will do everything we can to minimize this. But you know, uh, education for the first time in Indiana state history is half the state budget. And we have squeezed everything else as hard as we could. And you, you know, you just, eventually we had to go there. Anyone who says we should be spending more on K-12 education now is telling you, I want to raise your taxes. That's the only other choice, the reserves, right? We're using them all, I showed you. So the, the, an, honest, an honest advocate of that position should start by saying, and here are the taxes I want to raise. Is it business? Is it income? What is it, sales? Because you know we can't print this money like Washington does. Now, where'd we go? This is K-12 education going up and up and up from 95 on the left to 09 on the right, all-time records. Uh, same true if you count in the uh, you know, local and federal funds. Now this is per pupil spending. We're in the top, oh, what, 11 or something like that. This is, this is nominal dollars, but this is not the whole story. Indiana is a 92 cent state. It is less expensive to live here. Everyone in the room knows this, and the national data is quite available. If the average co uh, cost of living in America is 100, we're 92. Uh, it's one thing we like. It's part of that better sandbox that we offer to other, you know, that we point out to other businesses. When you adjust for the cost of living, our per pupil spending is third in America. Now, I'm proud of that. You should be too. We revere education in this state. We put our money where our mouth is. But those demanding more, more, more at some point should please recognize we're trying here. This is K-12 spending as a percent of personal income. We're seventh in America. There are only six places where people dig deeper into their pocket to support K-12. Again, it's something to be proud of. 
This is how much of your tax dollar actually gets to the classroom. We don't look very good. No, almost nobody in America does. There's only a couple states that get 70 cents to the classroom. We're closer to 60. There's, an awful, there's a huge increase in education spending, the kind that matters, available if your local school board and your superintendent would work half as hard on doing the common sense business things that you've all done, outsourcing this and that, combining overhead where you can, there's an ocean of money available. If they'd spend more time at that, less time lobbying at the state house, just give us more and then go away, our kids would be a lot better off. This is teacher pay. We're well above the average, but that doesn't account for the 92 cents. There we are, adjusted for the cost of living. That's how far, now I like that too. I hope we can make it more not for every single teacher. I happen to think the best teachers should get paid a lot more than this. There ought to be some measurement to see who's really getting results and who's not. I'm a sports fan, but frankly, I think the physics teacher should get paid more than the phys ed teacher. And things like that we don't do in Indiana. We pay our teachers more than a lot of other professions, professions represented in the room, honorable ones like nursing and accounting. I'm for this, I'm not against this. Paid about as much as architects in Indiana. When you look at this compared to other states, our teachers pay compared to other professions pay is very, very good. It is simply factually not true to suggest that we don't invest in education and that we aren't trying our very, very best to to do well by the people who are a part of it. And last slide. In this economic circumstance, now I think it's only fair to note that the average teacher in red is paid $10,000, 9,000 plus, 26% more than the average worker whose taxes pay for that job. That's okay, teaching's real important. But in the last year, the average worker in this state saw their income go down. The average teacher pays going up 4.4% this year. I have to ask the fairness question. Might it not be fair to take a time out? We've had to ask state employees who work pretty hard to take a two-year time out from pay increases. And I don't think it's an illegitimate question to say if there's a school district having some trouble, hey, we could use a little help from everybody. So um, that'll now, you're, are you sorry you asked me an education question? <laughs> Not at all. Well, I think these facts are of some relevance. I, I don't know what you think, but the, uh, um, we are all trying to get through this. We've got a lot to do in education, and it's going to involve more money. The sooner we can get there, the happier I'll be. But in the near term, we need a little balance in the debate. We need a little, few more facts, and now I hope you have learned a couple more. If you had the ability to uh, reach beyond the state and fix Social Security, how would you do that? Yeah, I don't think Social Security should be so hard to deal with. You know, this is, I suppose, um, uh, maybe it's naive, and I know all about third rails and so forth, but I'll tell you how I think we're going to have to have a grown-up discussion about this in this country, and pretty darn soon. So maybe, and I know it's easy to demagogue, and I know it's easy to... Uh, you know, just uh, uh, wave the, the the granny card and stifle debate. But doggone it, somebody's going to have to try. And you know, it won't take a genius. Um, one night I was watching Monday Night Football and way back, and um, somebody called Bill Walsh, the 49ers coach, a, I said, a genius. Joe Theismann said, now wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, this is football. He says, we're not geniuses in football. <laughs> he says, said, a genius is someone like Norman Einstein. Here's what I think we ought to say to each other as Americans. Uh, Medicare, by the way, is a little harder, but Social Security, let's just start there. There's a menu of things we can do, and I, for one, could go for any number of, any combination off that menu that, that um, protected today's and tomorrow's beneficiaries and did right by the younger generation. And I don't find it hard when it, it doesn't come up that often in my job. I don't bring it up. I, I stay in my lane, Indiana. But when, a, when a, I'm out there all the time, when a citizen asks me, I say, well, look, um, why are we paying for Bill Gates' health care? 
why are we paying, why are we going to send a pension check to Warren Buffett? Does that make any sense to you? Well, no. I said, no, I don't not to me either. The money we have ought to be for the folks who really need it to make it through their elderly years. I said, if you knew that your Social Security benefit, the one that's being paid today, would be protected for inflation all the way out, would that sound fair? They say, yeah. They don't realize that we do more than that today. If you retire today, you're going to get less than the guy who retires 10 years from now because they index it to wages and not costs. Um, you know, uh, would you retire a little later? Yeah. And then here's the big one to me. The only, we're going to finally have to do this, I predict to you. We're going to have to bifurcate these systems. We're going to have to say, hey, that Social Security system, that Medicare system we've had, it's great. They've been really good. But you know what? Math doesn't work. We cannot manage it anymore. So what we're going to have to do here is protect everybody that's in there or is within, you pick it, 10 years, 12 years, some years from, from now. Nothing changes. You're good to go. But all you younger folks, we just can't afford that. I mean, basically, don't say we. You can't afford that. All right? Today's workers are paying for today's retirees in the little box with your, num with your name on it. You paid for dad, and now your kid's going to pay for you. So um, you just say, we're going to have to have something a little different. And um, there's a lot of things, a lot of ways you can do that. And why? I don't think this will strike Americans as radical. Why? Well, some of you are thinking it right here in the room. We've done this. Tens of millions of Americans have been through this already. In both public and corporate America, there's all sorts of places where people got to that point. Hey, we're not funded anymore. We just, we're going to have to have an old plan and a new plan. We have an old teacher's plan and a more recent teacher's plan. This is just a common sense step. And once you decide to take that step, you can fix Social Security, and we could do it for Medicare too. And if this whole business called democracy and government by the consent of the governed is still valid, doggone it, we can be adult enough to solve that problem and all the rest we have too. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.